<laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode 20 of Manifesting with Meg. Tonight, I have Michelle Drucker here as my special guest. We're talking about embracing joy in June and all around the wonderful topic of passion, purpose, and visionary leadership. So I'd like to welcome, welcome Michelle. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> I'd like to give you guys all, uh, oh, well, first of all, before I even go forward, um, I have each of my guests pick a number that will match an intention. And at the end of the Magical Guide to Bliss, we read what the number that you pick is and match it to the intention that you set. So whatever that is, it's a surprise. At the end, you'll tell us, uh, if you want, to make it our, you know, X, no, <laughs> G-rated, big X and R rated. I don't know why I said that. Yeah, to make it G-rated, but um, at the end I'll ask you the number and your intention. Out of the 365. Yes, out of the 365. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a little introduction into the amazement that Michelle is. She's a powerhouse, and for all of you guys who are looking for an, a sustainable environment in this world, Michelle has become an incredible championship for the cause, and I've been able to actually witness over the years watching this whole um, movement that she's actually a part of progress. I'm, I can't be more proud of her. Uh, she has done an amazing job for awareness in our community here in uh, Miami, Florida, specifically Key Biscayne and beyond. And um, she actually started this whole sustainable movement at Department of Homeland Security, where she um, was uh, she she uh, had the first sustainability. Um, develop uh, pro ah, projects. So I'm going to read a little, little from it. <clears throat> so even though she does immigration matters for a living, she does. She has created the Miami um, Opla Sustainability Team, and they actually won three national awards through that. Correct, Michelle? Yes. Amazing. Three, three. in 2016, 2017, promoting a, you know strategic sustainability performance plan in the office, so the government can be actually answerable to um, maintaining a sustainable environment in their office place as well, which is a, it's quite a feat. I saw it happen and it was quite a feat, so I really am proud of her with regard to that. And in, in addition to that, she actually um, built cooperation and collaboration with um, other agencies as well as the U.S. Coast Guard, um, ICE, as well as Border Patrol and USCIS, and had a huge sustainability fair out over by um, the bay, which was fantastic. It was culminated, I don't remember the lady um, who actually spoke at the end, but it culminated with a presentation by one of the foremost experts in the whole King Tide situation with the um, with the climate change and everything that's happening from that point. She did speak, I don't know, what was her name again? Karen Bolter, uh, she's a flood risk consultant. Amazing, so she was there to actually educate a lot of us as to what's gonna happen if we don't get our, you know, what together so that, you know, the tides will stop rising at the rate that they are and that we can all become accountable and aware, and even in a small way. And um, she has since taken her program that she actually birthed at DHS to the PTSA with Kiva Singh School at Mass, and they were actually the recipients of some amazing awards. Why don't you tell the audience what exactly you just came back from Washington and now you're getting ready to go back and get the award? Sure. Um, so at, at Mass Academy, we created a sustainability committee. And in the first couple of years, we became a Florida Department of Environmental Protection Green Apple School. We won the Pepsi Recycling Rally. Can you explain what the Green Apple School is? Just so other people who are actually may, uh, may want a spark of insight from this might want to start that in your own communities. Sure. So uh, the Florida Green Apple Certification Program through the Florida Department of Environmental Protection essentially gives you a checklist of of categories that you have to um, show that you're having environmental reduced environmental costs and impacts such as a recycling program or a bike to school program, a no idling bus program, uh, we have organic gardens, there's a communications component which is a really critical piece to let everyone know in your school area the, the kinds of goals That's that amazing. you're setting for your students. And you got a ton of student buy-in on this effort as well, right? Your committee, at least with regard to the students, has gotten quite big. So uh, the program has about 100 families that are participating, and they show up for coastal restoration work days with Frost Science. Mm. We collaborate with the University of Miami's Green U, and we were um, one of only two schools this year to become a U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon School, wow. which is... Um, it's a very rigorous application process, so we're quite proud of that achievement. Well, just to let everyone know so they're not intimidated by the fact that, you know, you guys are already at that place, how long did that, in fact, take and you started small baby steps initially, correct? 
Correct. So in January of 2017, there's a local student activist. Her name's Delaney Reynolds. She came and spoke to the kids. Uh, they She had an all-day um, symposium with different classes, and she talked about sea level rise, and she has also addressed the United Nations. She appeared with Jack Black in National Geographic's Years oh, of wow. Dangerously. And the kids were inspired to become a zero net energy and zero waste school. So that started in January 2017. Amazing. And our strategy was to seek uh, local, state, and national recognition to keep building more success and getting more buy-in and keep scaling up because um, there's a really big gap between what the kids understand needs to happen, the conservation strategies, and the sustainability technology, and how their schools operate. So interestingly enough, um, when you started this, was it easy to get it off the ground or was it a, quite the effort to get people interested initially? So I think there's a lot of enthusiasm and there is an eagerness within the community and lots of stakeholders that want to contribute to the cause, but in terms of having a structure and getting organized and being very focused about how to scale up and have goals, mm -hmm. um, that was really we kind of had to reinvent the wheel. So that was a bit of, uh, of a challenge and it was uh, a lot of work, but we have gotten a lot of traction and we keep uh, getting more and more success. You know, I, I, I want to tell you, in addition to this, she also is the mother of three and she's an avid tennis player and she's definitely someone who enjoys being outdoors and really living in this beautiful um, city we he have here in Miami as you know a champion of the environment she definitely has a stake and I remember um, Michelle when we were actually talking about you know doing something to make a difference in our own communities on a smaller level and that was kind of goes to the point where we're talking about you know being a visionary and a leader you don't have to be you know run offices or do you can actually start in your little corner of the world and move forward accordingly why don't you share a little bit about how that was sparked and you know why you do what you do now. Sure, so I uh, grew up in Martin County and it's much more rural than Miami and I spent a lot of time in the water so I've always enjoyed being outdoors and I had a little Boston Whaler before I could drive. And That's awesome. That was my childhood experience and I would ride my bike to work periodically, especially in the winter time. So as I would come over the Miami Bridge, I would see a lot of trash and debris in the Miami River and I would also see manatees. And one day, after years of sort of huh. getting disgusted by this, I saw a manatee trying to navigate around. This was in Miami? In Miami, okay, yes. Right, right Miami. here, okay. blocks okay. from your wow. house, actually, wow. and blocks from our office. Um, trying to navigate around a lawn chair, and I thought, you know, who's responsible for this? And at this point, I'm a mom, I'm an attorney, I know I have, like, a certain privilege and status in the community, and it dawned on me, I'm like, I should be yeah. responsible for this. I mean, <laughs> why not? If not me, then who? Yeah. So that's how it kind of got started, and I realized that we have a sustainability plan within our agency, and uh, we ju I just started to learn the program and understand the goals, and I wanted to communicate the program to our attorneys, and it was really exhilarating to be part of something that was so purposeful and directed, and I knew they had the best scientists in the world come up with these plans, yeah. and it was... It was exciting to see, like, oh, this is what we're supposed to be doing. I get it now. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's really interesting because um, in other parts of the country besides Florida or Miami, for, for that matter, um, a lot of the places have recycling efforts, you know. And, and when Michelle initially brought all these, you know, speakers to our agency, you know, and bolstering up what we had and what we wanted to have there, it was really great insight so that we're all aware of the little things that we could do to make a difference on a whole because you know everyone gets overwhelmed with you know the whole efforts you know like we were saying you guys got the green apple now you got all these awards now but it took you years and you started at the very bare minimum so why don't you like speak to that so if you wanted to engage other people who are listening you know as to how they can make a difference you know in spite of all the chatter that's going around that there's no climate change there's no this that that but we can actually do something in our little corners of the world that'll have a ripple effect beyond our imaginations if you just start 
Sure. Um, you know, I was really inspired by a lot of the different organizations in Miami, and there was one expression that I saw repeated, which I guess is not unknown to a lot of people, but it's, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito in your room. Um, that's great, especially nowadays in Miami. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, I kind of would, I held on to that, and I realized that um, if I, if I just learn the information and, and try mm -hmm. to apply programs that I know are gonna get traction with leadership. So yeah. I knew an award from Department of Homeland Security would be popular with my management. Yeah. Just like I knew an award with the uh, principal at Mass Academy for schools would get traction. Even though the bigger goal is a net zero energy school, that's like crazy ambitious and a principal would never go for that. But, oh, a Green Apple Award, well, you know, that's something people can wrap their head around. That's and so my recommendation is if there's something that you're interested in doing, try to find programs that your leadership um, will have a hard time saying no to because they're out there. A lot of these programs are out there that you can try to track, you know, the, the requirements of it and just, you know, take your time. There's, there's so much interest. And in fact, and I know, Meg, you, you mentioned there's, you know, these climate deniers. In fact, those people are real outliers. I mean, even uh, Republicans under 40, 75 percent of them are really concerned about this position about, you know, climate and ambivalence. And like everybody knows, there's really no debate about that. Um, I know when I started it, there was three, four years ago, yeah. there was still that hesitation. But everyone's really come on board. And now the question is, how do we tackle it? And um, well, at least you're getting so they know the problem. They're getting to the solution stage, which is definitely something that we don't really actually hear in the mainstream media at this point. Because you just came back from Washington D.C. and tell a little bit about that as far as your experience with the whole efforts that you made with the kids. Sure, that was really exciting, and and I think the biggest takeaway I had from that is, um, well, let me let me back up. In my process of be, of securing these Department of Homeland Security Sustainability Awards, and they had different categories, uh, Green Team, Sustainability Hero. I met a lot of the local stakeholders already working on this. The University of Miami has Green U, even our county has these transportation programs, carpooling, bike lanes, all these, all these programs exist, but it was about communicating um, how to access those programs for employees. Um, and I met an individual who was part of the Citizens Climate Lobby. It's the largest volunteer organization in the country. It's 100,000 members, and their goal is to come up with a bipartisan solution to bring down carbon emissions. And right now, there is a bill in Congress called the Energy Efficiency, excuse me, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And it's essentially using the free market by um, putting a tax on carbon that will come back to members of the public, just like a tax okay. refund. It doesn't go into government hands. It goes back to um, to the, the constituents, the community, okay. to every every single man, woman, and child. And the idea is if you price what it really costs our environment and our economy in storms and environmental degradation, capturing the true cost of fossil fuels, you will unleash <laughs> this green technology wow. and be, make it more competitive. Um, so I went with my son That's for the exciting. second year in a row and two other, actually three other families, but two other families from Mast Academy. And every member of Congress and every senator was lobbied wow. about the Energy mm -hmm. Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And we now have, I think, 51 members of Congress, exciting, yeah. including a Republican congressman. Uh, and the takeaway from that is, wow, they really are just people. and. They will see you, yeah. they will talk to their constituents, and they will hear what you have to say. And the big key is listening, that this organization is so sophisticated. You have to know how to listen and talk people's talk um, to be able to, to connect. Because we all, everybody wants a healthy environment. Everybody wants Miami to be livable. And you just have to know. <laughs> you can breathe the air. That'd yeah. be nice, right? Breathe the air. Everybody wants to have clean air. So if you mm -hmm. just, um, know how to communicate your goal without making people defensive, you'll just get a lot further. Well, that kind of goes into the next question that I have for you, Michelle, is like, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you arrived at this place where you were able to better identify your passion and have it match your purpose. Well, I, like I said, I grew up in Martin County and it was pretty rural. Uh, 
it, it grew quickly. But when I was a kid, I walked around the community, you know, my neighborhood with my big black lab, and I didn't mm. have, and I didn't wear shoes. And all the people from the Northeast were like, "Where are your shoes? Like, They're at the house." Um, so I was in nature a lot. I was in the river a lot. Um, I picked up, you know, hermit crabs and little mangrove crocodiles, and I saw the manatees. And like I said, I had a little putt putt boat before I could drive. So I had always made uh, a connection with nature. And when I got to Miami, you know, I felt a little hemmed in by the urban environment, but there's still so much nature and access in, in Miami that uh, I just was paying attention because I really care about the, the natural beauty around us and I felt like I had to do my part. Well, you know, it's interesting because Michelle, you and I have known each other for quite some time when we started in um, the summer of 99. And, um, you know, I might not be someone who would jump on the leadership of say like an envi environmental bandwagon. However, I've learned so much from you as to how to you know at least do the little things in what in my little in my little community, and that kind of goes to leadership. And and when you do take the helmet, some people are afraid to actually do anything because they're they are you know maybe they're not, they don't feel like they have anything to say or that they don't have anything to stand because they're not in a leadership situation or in their in their office or even in their in their life. However, um, you know the best visionaries that we have turn into leaders are not the ones. Who are the managers? The ones who have the power? The ones who are actually, you know, hitting the ground with the with the, you know, the the awareness. And I think that you know, we were talking. I, I think one of the questions I had, you know, like, you know, when a ballerina, you know, is passionate about what she does, and then she's certainly, you know, like a, a gazelle across the stage. You know, you you admire the results of the ballerina's hard work, but you 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 fail to see, you know, the toes that are mangled at this point because, you know, she puts so much effort. It's kind of like when you start at something like this, you, you put a lot of work in, a lot of blood, sweat and tears, a lot of frustration. And and maybe you can speak to that a little bit as far as and maybe not even in only in the environmental context, maybe in a bigger context when people have some passionate ideas that they want to see unfold and they want to jump into it. And they're just feeling a little bit intimidated and you know they, they don't want to fail so they don't want to do it so why don't you it maybe the thing that you know sparked your interest and that you know made you feel like it's necessary to actually do something uh, I have to have to unpack that yeah that's a lot <laughs> um, <laughs> I threw it all out. I threw it a lot out. I thought, hey Sandra there's Sandra she went to actually Washington DC with uh, Michelle yes, that's yes, very cool I think the reason why I've been able to keep at it is because this matters to a lot of people. It doesn't just matter to me. And what keeps me going is when I get the feedback. Um, when I started at my office, even though um, it's a conservative environment, I mean that's the bottom line. And anything that's not that sort of seems a little too not conservative was uh, was met with hesitation. Put it that way. So I would get a, a, a text from somebody saying, hey, my kid was recycling this weekend. And you'd see yeah. this little three-year-old putting a, a, a recyc you know, an aluminum can yeah. in a recycling bin. And so I was getting that type of reinforcement. This, those, little, those little nods of, of affirmation that reinforced to me that this matters to other people too. And I mean, the truth is, if, you want to go fast, go alone. Yeah. If you want to go far, you've got to go together. That's right. So I that's amazing. That's actually feel like huge. that's a that's a big part of the success. And a little bit is it happens to be something that a lot of people care about, not just me. And I yeah. I'm voicing something that people are interested in trying to help with as well. You know, so so back to that. You know, as far as like, I know you, and I know that you're passionate about a lot of things, and I know that you're very outspoken with regard to those things that really matter to you. And you know, today's quote in our my book is by one of my favorites, Joseph Campbell, you know, the hero's journey. And his um, quote today for in the, the Magical Guide to Bliss is the big question is whether you're going to be able to say a hearty yes to your adventure. So you know, talking about you know this concept of you know making uh, gr uh, leaps. And, and bounds of change in the environment, but can also be seen as quite the adventure too, because it's something that you're passionate about. You set out on the journey to actually discover what it is that you can do, 
and then you come back to seeing what you've done, which is, you know, it's great to get that kind of informa affirmation, but also that you've changed a lot of the little people, like the, like, you know, the kids that you might be recycling more, or this, that, and the other. So tell me a little bit about how does that speak to you about the adventure, you know, the whole idea that this is an adventurous life and we're ready to go. Well, I think even though I'm in this very bureaucratic uh, environment, I feel that this this hat that I wear and, and what I was able to do in my agency was actually quite entrepreneurial because I, I had to find stakeholders that were willing to contribute to the program and there was a lot of creativity involved and if one person said no, then we had to figure out, okay, there must be somebody else who can um, you know, fill that gap for us. Yeah. So every yes was very exciting and it was super collaborative. I mean, I, I was really focused in what I thought was possible and how to execute on these goals, but um, it was hugely collaborative. And I, I remember when some the Key Biscayne Community Foundation said, hey, you, you've got to do a mission and vision statement. And I was like, what? <laughs> oh. like, okay, you start dancing, right? <laughs> Figure it out. Like, oh, really? Okay, all right. So then I did it. And, I, and so it's been great because that's my five second elevate, elevator yeah. speech is we want to be the first for the school setting, the first net zero energy and zero waste school in Florida. That uh, is easy for people to, to wrap their head around and be like, well, that's pretty ambitious. But, but you know, I do want to point out also though, adventurous as you are, you are a traveler. You've gone all over the world. You've spoken to people from Australia when you went on a trip to Australia, New Zealand. I mean, you could speak to that as well, but you have been exposed to other cultures, other societies, and that's actually been an amazing part of your adventurous journey because you're able to see what it's like in other places and bring it back here. I will say that, yes, it's sort of like when you buy a new car, your beetle bug, and all of a sudden you see beetle bugs yeah, everywhere. Yeah. So when I was in South Africa with my husband, I was like, look, recycling bins and composting <laughs> bins. And then I would talk to people and they'd say, oh yeah, we are suffering. I mean, they had those terrible droughts in Cape Town yeah. where they had these water rations and people would say, oh, we can't catch the fish that we used to catch. And I mean, a lot of stories I hear are a bit heartbreaking. I know in Australia they had terrible wildfires, they had terrible storms. We just came back um, from Vietnam. They have a terrible you know, trash collection problem and a lot of plastic waste. So sometimes that's really overwhelming and you just think, how are we going to overcome all of these, um, all of these industrial impacts that are in motion? But the awareness is also there. So I, I think I, I don't know. I don't know necessarily that those places are teaching me, but it's reinforcing that this is a really an international um, interest. I mean, the climate Paris Climate Accords were signed by everybody. Yeah. And Trump is the only person who's pulled out. Every single, even Iran, <laughs> even you know, shooting down our drones. But I'm just. It's, like, <laughs> it's everywhere, right? I'm um, never gonna go there. But I'm gonna go to the same time. Even could do like political even because God only knows we're not fans, but that's okay. <laughs> but even, even the bad guys, right, are yeah. understanding like, this is a problem that affects every single person on this planet. Yeah, it's not like you're gonna get like your bubble and walk around in it and get protected when you're, you're, the air you breathe is not gonna but, be able to be breathed. I, I have to tell you the the publication for the Department of Homeland Security, it's called the Climate Action Plan, and the picture on the front of it is a house floating in the ocean. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> That's crazy. That was 2014. Wow. I, I, my eyes popped out of my head because it was pretty sensational, yeah. and they show like, you know, ice sheets collapsing and wildfires, and because those scientists get it, and they've known for a while. Are they still how, there? Yes, <laughs> actually, <laughs> the climate plan is still in place. They just don't measure carbon emissions anymore. Okay. But it saves money, so okay. that's why they kept it in place because it, it's uh, a money maker. It, it, so, like, even like, so let's speak to like the fact that you know everybody ha like I'm doing I'm doing a certificate of happiness right now. I want to add this because he calls it the climb. He calls it the climb. There's like a mountain, and when you target happiness or joy in your life and you seek that out then it's the climb, you gotta go up the mountain, figure out how to get up the mountain, and then you grab the collaborators along the way, right? And it's not luck, it's actually hard work matched with luck, Fair right? Yes. So you have to work 
to walk up, the, as I know, in walking anywhere. Like, you have to work to walk up the mountain. But then people start to join you, so it becomes a very collaborative effort. And that's probably, probably one of the things that you found um, more often than not now in this, you know, how many years have you been doing this now? Um, like three, four years now. Okay. Well, wait, when was Trump Since elected? Since 2016. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I started in 2015, and then, honestly, after Trump was elected, I was told that I can't do this in my office anymore. So I said, okay, well, let me bring all those stakeholder connections to the school setting because they were asking for it in the school setting and it's been like an immediate buy-in and no hesitation by the kids and the families which i think is amazing aspect. because it was an opportunity that you took you didn't they said no one place but the door opened somewhere else which is always what you have to look for and pay attention for which is what you did you saw the door opening for you and, another, and you've been able to actually take it to another level on the community on the, yes. community, the community level, which, you know, had it stayed with DHS, you probably never would have have uh, branched out to the extent that you have, because I know that you would have, because I know you. <laughs> but, but yeah, but for sure, that's something that, you know, has benefited a lot of people. Now, in your bio as well, you just got back from the Arizona State University of the School of Sustainability. I find that amazing. You're a, a 2019 cohort, which is fantastic. So tell me what, what exactly that is, okay. first and foremost, and what happened there so maybe people can benefit from the knowledge that you gained for sure. that week that you were there. Um, so that was exhilarating. Being around all these sustainability experts and the professors, so Arizona State University was the first sustainability college in the country, and that was they started the program 11 years ago. They were the first program in the country. Fast forward 11 years later, there's 850 programs. Wow. University of Miami, offers a certification as well and a master's because um, corporations, one third of Fortune 500 corporations um, now have sustainability programs and science-based targets to measure their carbon emissions. For instance, um, Walmart has the Gigaton Project. And what is that? I didn't even know about that. So the Gigaton Project, what was so exciting about being with all these professionals and, and the professors, because you have the business professors and a PhD uh, professor, what was it? Um, basically they look, I forget what it's called, but you look at how organisms survive in nature and you look at their effectiveness, like, you know, how does a butterfly fly? Well, you look at the engineering of a butterfly and you think, well, can I mim biomimicry? That's what it's called. It's biomimicry. Called biomimicry. Biomimicry. Okay. So anyway, the Gigaton project, um, it's to get the supply chain uh, providers, which is the biggest part of of Walmart's Sorry. of no, Walmart's okay. uh, carbon footprint. It's not the stores that sell stuff. It's getting all those products to market and how those products are brought to market. Like even and so. They so are, Walmart's actually a part of this, like a part yeah, of actually so, making a difference? That's so what know. Walmart has done is they have their suppliers sign up on their website and they document their um, how they produce things, how they're acquiring, I don't oh, know, maybe it's so. beef for the, they have, you know, beef for their hamburger section. You know, are you buying beef that's sustainably raised and farmed wow. and not, not um, well, cutting down? Doing this. This is Walmart. Wow. Um, anyway, so it's not uncommon. I mean, this is actually very, very mainstream. It's only the media where we see this kind of acrimony and sense that there's any debate at all. It's just, it's not debatable. It, there's, for instance, the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out with this warning that we have 11 years to cut our emissions 50% if we are to prevent irreversible catastrophic climate change. Um, that was based on 6,000 peer-reviewed science reports, 91, not either 91 countries or 91 scientists. I mean, it's so irrefutable. But um, So how's that going over? <laughs> well, it's going over fine in every other part of the world except yeah. for, you know, special interest here. And even the fossil fuel companies just told the Pope last week that they want to start cutting their emissions. Like, they're just, everyone is desperate for some leadership on this. Yeah. Um, I think we're all desperate for some leadership in general, though, Michelle. That would be nice, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I had to say that, like literally, because we are talking about leadership and visionaries. And when we look for leadership and vision, we're people who want to make a difference from public service to serve the people to greater goals and higher standards and better, better world. I, yeah. I think what my takeaway from this is that um, 
I guess maybe the scientist or the specialist in this area, they do get kind of siloed and there is that echo chamber. But if you can just tap into that a little bit, you can bring that information and knowledge to your home, to your workplace, to your, you know, your school, your community. Um, because I do think that the reality is, you know, Donald Trump doesn't have to get electric buses for our school district. Yeah. Our school district has to get electric yeah. buses for yeah. our school district. Yeah. Our kids need to recycle in our schools. Donald Trump is not going to get every kid to recycle, right? So the point is, we are all responsible for making sure we have a healthier planet. That's it's a not huge just point. one person. And that's a huge, huge point that we all are accountable as well. Because if it's what, 11 years for this irrefutable evidence to come true, and then we can start today doing something that's gonna make a difference, then at least we're doing something that's gonna make a difference. Like, I know what we were all talking about, like with the hairspray back in the day, you know, that they said the ozone layer was like eating away at the ozone layer, everybody with the breck, everybody needed their big hairdo, you know, whatever. And, and, and you are the one who pointed out to me that that actually was able to so, re be reversed. Yeah, so th that's the exciting part. Like it, it's, um, it can be overwhelming and scary. And I, when I first had my mo my aha moment, like this is not a hundred years from now, this is happening right now. I literally, for the first time in my life, did not sleep for 36 oh hours. Oh my God. That is never That's right, I remember that me. though. I Ever. remember that And though. I went, oh my God, like, oh my what God. am I gonna yeah. do? So, um, but there are lots of success stories. We, the, the bald eagles rebounded from near extinction. Even in, in Florida where our manatees um, have rebounded. Because when you have public policy that follows the best science, you actually get these positive outcomes. For instance, like the ozone hole has gotten smaller because we said, hey, it's chlorofluorocarbons that are causing the ozone hole to grow. Um, you remember acid rain yes. back in, yes. in Europe in the, yes. in the 80s? We managed to control that too. So we need to listen to the scientists to form our public policy and recognize that this is just too important um, not to not to pay attention to. So I, I look for the success stories. I'm yes. you know I'm I like a realist, that you do. <laughs> um, but as long as you know that that success is is out there and possible, I mean we have no choice. We can only go, in my opinion, forward in the direction yeah. of, of what we want to achieve for our community and our families. And you know, I like that you say that you look for the success stories because I think people feel like, what can I do? Like they throw their hands up. And then when you do have those positive affirmations, like you're saying it's positive hits, so it's a little, you know, it makes you get excited about doing something more. And, and then those become the next thing that you build on. And you know, scientists only know what they know today. They have to have the opportunity to keep, you know, researching and investigating new ways that we can do better, you know, because we're not the only ones here. We have, you know, creatures on this world, like you're saying, the manatees and, and all the, that were subjected to this extinction no longer, which is, is, which is amazing. So there can, you can make a difference, you can do something, and I think that that's an amazing thing that you point out as well. Um, I wanted to, to ask you, like, okay, so I know you have three kids. You know, how does this, how does this, you know, hit them? Like your efforts and your mission, how does it hit your kids? Because I know when I say anything, my kids will generally zone out and not listen, but maybe yours are more aspired to greatness. <laughs> well, they might be are, but you know, anyway. No, you know, it's hard to be a prophet in your own land. And, I like um, it. I, sometimes I think that, um, when my 17 year old is irritated, he will mm. deliberately put his plastic water bottle in the trash, <laughs> even though the recycling in bin is you. right next to right it. Right in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I'm like, are you trying to trigger yeah. me? But yeah. it's okay because they're, they do do better and then they'll tell me stories like, hey, you know, um, that's my great. teacher mentioned something about the green apple or certification or the award. Like they're proud. They're yes. proud of it, and they have a lot of information because they can't get away from it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I always but, say, whatever happens, I'll be the little noise in their ear that they'll yes. have to hear even when I'm not standing next to them. So at least I'm like like a little mosquito, right? Like the little mosquito. And I will say, my 17 year old was amazing. He was in the senator's office, Senator Rubio's office. Donna Shalala's office last year with Ileana Ross Layton. He tells these great stories, and people really, um, they're drawn to the younger voices, I and mean, they just seem to have no hidden agenda, right? They're so yeah. authentic, and I know he's, he's proud of his, That's his part of it, 
but I do think he sees like how hard I work and how a little bit obsessive I am about it that he's like, I don't want to really go that far. But you know, I'm watching like who's online right now, like Karen Todd, Linda Dalton, all these powerhouses with uh, amazing mission, you know, Juliana Marto is there, women and, and, and men who, you know, they have a, they have a very strong voice and they bring it to the fore. And they're gonna make a difference when they speak because that's the kind of people they are. So it's kind of like you inspiring your kids. That's amazing that you bring a young generation to see that they are capable of doing something. That also is these, you know, even even all of us. Like Kevin Cregan is amazing. You know, coming to the fore and actually bringing your own special spark of magic to this this endeavor that can do so much for so many you know, and, and maybe push back the clock on 11 years. It won't be that way. So I will say um, one of the things that I have found um, just very touching to me and, and keeps me energized is the program that we have at MAST, um, I actually think this was like a really good strategy, was that we gave parents um, credit to apply towards their children oh, to get recognized really? by Cross Science. Ah, yes. There you go. So parents that participate, That's half good. of their service hours go towards their kids getting recognition. That's genius. Uh, um, <laughs> That's genius. It is. It's genius, Michelle. Yeah. Very nice. It worked. But Very nice. even though my kids only showed up a couple of times, these kids and these parents, particularly, it's so beautiful to see these Brazilian families. They know how to garden and they oh, understand. Awesome. You yeah. know, the organic gardens and the shade house. And my friend Sandra, who's watching, who's from Columbia, yeah. and she made sure we got the, the bike uh, to school program going Amazing. and being able to delegate. Um, but what's also happened is we have had kids address our school board. And we had a, a third grader address our school board about eliminating plastic waste in the cafeteria. A third grader. A third wow. grader. So articulate. That's amazing. So outstanding. And the teachers, they're That's following amazing. our chat group. We have teachers from Carver amazing. Middle, from Sunset Elementary. Um, there's so much interest in coming together and having a collective voice. And in fact, uh, we've been asking, I, two years ago I addressed the school board about how you really need a, you need a sustainability plan like what I've observed at DHS because right. these other big school districts have it. Los Angeles, New York has 100 zero waste schools, and it was kind of crickets. I mean, they weren't listening, but all of a sudden... You get a green apple. It's, <laughs> no, well, that, that, and before that? That's Mass Academy, okay. but at, in the larger district level, they're paying attention. Oh, I mean, Carvalho came up to our, we had a kid address uh, the school board last week um, saying, go get that Volkswagen settlement money. I don't know if you, you know, the diesel gate from Volkswagen. Oh, wow. Every state is getting, we're getting $166 million. Wow. In Florida. Wow. So it's to mitigate. What the, is that? Tell us, because I don't, okay. I didn't hear about this. This is interesting. So before I, I give more about that, basically the student addressed the school board and said, Go get that money. Please get us electric buses. Wow. We have very high uh, emissions problems in our loading areas. Wow. And Carvalho came up to her and he said, you know, we're going to get electric buses. Wow. Um, <laughs> not, maybe not right away, but the point is, a year ago, nobody was listening to us. And so it's really, it's so exciting to see the momentum, to see the enthusiasm. That's great. Um, so, but the, so the VW settlement money, for anybody who's out there and who's interested, um, Florida gets $166 million, and they're deciding as a state how they're going to distribute the money, and uh, one way that the public has asked for is electric school buses. So electric school buses are quite expensive. Yes. Uh, they're about $350,000, and a regular diesel bus is $200,000. But over the lifetime of the bus, you save about 70% on maintenance, and because it's really simple. There's no yeah. oil changes, there's no gears, it's just boom. Um, but with the settlement money, they should be able to subsidize those buses and bring down our emissions, especially, I don't want to overwhelm people with data, but the biggest contributor of emissions on the roads is the school district. They do 18 million, wow. 18 million wow. miles a year That's on amazing. our roads. 18 million miles? 18 million oh miles. Oh my God. 50,000 kids. You don't even think about that though. You just like yeah. see, it's just such a part of our like the school buses, the yellow school buses back and forth. 18 million miles? 18 million. Wow, and what kind of what kind of um, benefit would it have if you put the electrical bus electrical bus on there? So, uh, this sixth grader addressed the school board last week, and she measured the carbon wow. emissions. Um, you know, when everyone talks about 350.org, yeah. well, that was the hope, whatever it was, ten years ago, to keep CO2 emissions at, at 350 parts per million in the atmosphere. Oh. And now we're at, we've zoomed up to like 400. Wow. But a healthy 
level in uh, indoor air quality, like what we're breathing is about 500 parts per million. Well, she measured that inside the buses, it's 5,000 parts oh. per million. And you can smell it. Like wow. you can feel like oh. queasy just waiting for the bus. Wow. And she said, look, this is what's happening in our buses. Wow. You know, the drivers won't turn off their engines, so let's just eliminate this behavioral Amazing. issue and get the electric buses straight out. Um, and they're doing it in California, of course. You of know, course, California, California. <laughs> is, is doing it. Yeah. Just like, um, you know, you'd be very surprised, a lot of these red states have uh, much more renewable energy than in Florida. Oh, really? Really? Texas Florida. is way ahead of us. Um, I'm not surprised. Lots of wind farms. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you have been working with this. So I just want to say um, kudos to you, Michelle. I'm so proud of you. And I honestly, on behalf of the community of South Florida, you know, what you've done in uh, such a little time with these great, I mean, mostly the awareness with the kids, you know, even that, because you can't do it alone. No man is an, no man or woman is an island. So you need the buy-in for many people and that you're actually waking these people and these kids up to something really that's going to have a direct impact on their future is fantastic. So I really want to say I'm super proud of you. Congratulations. It is quite Thank the feat. And I know that, you know, I, I, I know that a lot of us are appreciative because everybody has their stronghold at what they're passionate about, what brings them joy. And it's important that everybody bring their talents and skills to the table and that we're different is even better. So we can all, you know, it's a big world we live in, you know, this earth. And you know that it's important that you educate us and we educate you and, and on and on it becomes that collaborative effort which is amazing but I wanted to ask you where are you right now on your journey as far as your profession and your personal career is this, you know, where do you want to take it to the next level if if that were the case for your dreams and aspirations embracing your greatest joy um, you know I think about that a lot because sometimes I think well maybe I'm right where I need to be because I get to be the noisy parent and no <laughs> one can really say, oh, you know, you can't say that, you can't, you know, you can't call out the superintendent or the school board member. I mean, we're, I'm diplomatic about it, but yeah. the point is, you know, I'm encouraging the kids to say, um, you know, the emperor has no clothes, like, we need to do something about that. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, I wonder, uh, am I, am I uh, putting forth the, or is my community and myself getting the best use of my, what do they call it, knowledge, skills, and abilities, right? Yes. So the, the KSA. The KSA. <laughs> the KSA. Um, so Such a government worker, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> never goes. Never knowledge, goes. skills, and abilities. Yeah, the acronyms never die. That's pretty so, cool. <laughs> I, I mean, professionally, I am an attorney. I am, you know, it, it's such a little hat you know I, remember that show remember that movie um office space with yeah yeah yes, 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 all the flair well all the flair mine's like maybe a little button at the back of my neck is my dhs flair right oh. the rest <laughs> of it is just covered with everything else so yeah. yeah you wear a lot of hats in this in this life um well are you concerned about your legacy like as far as what you're going to leave behind i know that we you know a long time ago when we were you know younger or perhaps more you know um we had the you know, the, the, you know, the possibility, it, it's still there, and clearly, and we know a lot more, and we've had a lot more pushback, but you know, when you have that you know, Pollyanna kind of mentality toward the world, you know, at that point your vision now has become a reality in, in, a, in a small way and in a big way, so keeping that in mind, are you more concerned at this point in your life, knowing your kids are growing older, about your legacy as far as what you want to leave, and are you quite there yet? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things at Arizona State University, um, you know, I, I put it to the professor. So what do you do when you're getting uh, so much resistance and people are shutting you down? And when you know it's, it's staring everybody in the face, it's so obvious that we need to be moving forward yeah. on this. And they said, you know, sometimes you need to turn around and look behind you and see how far you've come. That's pretty awesome. And I know that, like, Two years seems like a long time, but I have so much like affection and appreciation from these families, and I think it's such a beautiful thing seeing these moms and dads and their kids working together, because I think that's pretty rare. It's not yeah. easy to see Family collaboration members. with a parent and a teenager, yeah. and, and yeah. I, I find that enormously rewarding, and, and I'm very touched by it, um, and I feel like I get reinforcement from lots of different areas, and the reality is, I mean, if somebody else takes this on, and, and I know that like the Cleo Institute is a really, um, uh, it's a 
it's becoming, it's, it has a lot more notoriety and they have been pushing for climate literacy. The CLEO stands for what again? I don't know what CLEO okay. stands for, but it was but started C -L -E by, CLEO, it was started okay. by a Gulliver science teacher and she was named like one of Time Magazine's wow. most influential South Florida leaders because she's been speaking out about climate change for a while and they're getting traction. Like there's a lot of synergy. Yeah. So my, my opinion, my legacy um, is working with all these community groups and these parents and these families and creating this the same kind of enthusiasm and passion and working with rigor towards these goals that matter to me when I see other families doing it yeah. and other organizations doing it I know I'm part of something that's that you know is bigger than myself that's and that's really rewarding you know, I wanted to mention when you said it's important to look back and see how far you've come because I think a lot of people are so interested in moving, 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 moving that they fail to stop and take accountability for the things that they do good. We're all so ready to say all the things that we do badly, right? I mean, everyone's like, oh, God, you can berate you know, yourself to the nth degree, right? Especially as parents and how, you know, we feel like we've not, you know, right, risen to the and challenged amazingly. But I think that what you said, looking back and seeing where you've come from so that you know that at least where you're going is a little brighter because you have come a long way. And I think that's an amazing point that they pointed out. And plus, you've already applied by the fact that you've taken accountability as to what you've impacted. So that's amazing as well, Michelle. I think that's awesome. You know, I, I, I wanted to talk about the leadership with vision. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, are concerned that they're stuck and they can't move and and how can you be happy in a time when you feel like the world is falling apart around you and you know all of this tension and kind of atrophy not expansion that that we look for and and how we um, want to be a part of this world as leaders with vision wherever we show up so I wanted to ask you what inspiration do you have to offer anyone who's listening today especially Brandon and Susanna our, our good friends from um, DHS as well you know as how they can focus on their own talents and and look to embrace that joy that's going to you know bring forth their wonder and their amazement that's going to do something that's going to make a difference like you've done today um, well, you know, I think it, it's not as mystical as it sounds to uh, to find my magic. Oh my well, God! No, no, no. no Michelle. To, to, oh, Michelle. To, to find happiness, you know, intuitively, you know what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a great National Geographic book called The Blue Zones. And they, oh, they, tell me about the blue. You love the blue zones, sure. and I think it's really important that everyone at least have a bit of knowledge in case they want to seek it out and, and actually get some great tips from the Blue Zone website, actually, right? Yeah. Well, yes, and, and I guess just sort of backing up a little bit, I don't think it's that that um, challenging, per se, to figure out what, you know, what are the components that you need to be happy and healthy. So the Blue Zones um, went to different places around the world where people regularly live to 100 without infirmity, their faculties intact, and the common themes, this is, there was the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, this island in Greece, Okinawa, Japan, and the common themes were that uh, the people there that lived long, they had intergenerational living, um, they spent six hours a day with people that they really, that they really liked, mm -hmm. they had a plant-based diet, more, you know, plants instead of heavy on the meats. They exercise, but it was really incorporated into their day-to-day -day living, like in Okinawa, they get up yeah. and down off the floor. You know, 50 times a day yeah. in Greece, you have to bring your groceries <laughs> up a cliff. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but the point is that book kind of zeroed in on these things that you need. You need, you need sleep. You need exercise. You need nutrition. You need friendship. Oh yeah. Um, you need community. What we would we do without our friends? That's I don't. Right. I think we'd go crazy, right? I think we all would go crazy if we didn't have our our community of amazing people surrounding us to support us as well as support them as well. So I think that's certainly a point. And, yeah. Um, and so the author talks about uh, passion, pleasure, and purpose. Okay. Are the triple P's. I'm going to write that down on the feed, so don't you worry. Ple passion, pleasure, and purpose. I like that. Yes. So you need to have you know passion in your life, and and I have it with you know my friends and my family, and this this endeavor that I'm passionate about. Um, you need purpose, and sometimes I joke with my husband, we have more purpose than we can handle. But, <laughs> but that's okay. Oh, I love that. Uh, and, awesome. then, and then pride. 
right. Yeah. And, and for sure, I, I feel really good and validated by the recognition, which is which is a nice perk. And what I appreciate about that is it builds credibility in and yeah. it allows the program to, you know, success breeds success. So when you're able to demonstrate you had success and other people are mm -hmm. uh, willing to give you resources and to keep growing, you know, growing your program. So I guess the point is, um, if you know what you're doing is purposeful, if it gives you pride, if you have pleasure in it, if you have passion for yeah. it, even when it's exhausting or discouraging <laughs> yeah. or you get demoralized, just keep coming back to those themes. So, so passion, pleasure, and purpose. Figure out what those things are in your life and do more of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like do more as much as you can of that. And make sure you get your sleep. And make sure you get your sleep. And, and definitely, Go make sure you get coffee with your friends. If a drink is not coffee, then maybe a glass of wine. But it's important to be interrelational, like you said, because that truly is where the greatest ideas come about, where you get inspired like we did so long ago, and we continue to inspire each other. Michelle has been one of my greatest uh, colleagues of genius, I think, because when you have those conversations, it sparks what I call genius. So I think you can continue to try doing that. And you never know what great things and great people you'll be surrounded by. So, and in any any walk of life, anywhere that you are. So, I definitely would encourage that. So, back at the beginning of our interview, which we're coming to the end, my okay. my friend, um, I asked you to pick a number and and set an intention. So, what was your intention? And then tell me your number. Um, so, my intention was to connect and have fun with Meg yes. and be thankful that she's taken so much interest and. In, uh, the project that I've been working on for the community. So I think that happened. Yes. I miss you. I do miss Meg you. Meg is, I do. is a <laughs> supremely incredible listener and I, I, your love and affection comes out through your listening. It's really such a gift that you have. Um, and I try and I tell myself, okay, I need to be like Meg. I need to listen better. I need to listen better. I like, so I make sure you recycle. I think I was in Omega, <laughs> Omega and Ryan Beck, and the lady was about to yell at me to make sure I recycle. I go, I know I have a Michelle in my life. <laughs> so don't worry. I hear it in my little ear too. Her kids and me. So there you go. For sure. Um, so my number was 250. 250. So what we do at this point, you know, matching um, the intention, um, this is what you picked. So we read it to the audience to share with them what it is that the Magical Guide to Bliss says today as a part of our interview. Okay, this is such a megaism, right? It's <laughs> such a megaism. It, it, it really, yeah. it captures a bit of what yeah. we talked about, but um, August 16th, enthusiasm is contagious. Whatever you do, do it well. Do it so well that when people see you do it, they will want to come back and see you do it again, oh and they will want to bring others and show them how well you did what you do. It's Walt crazy. Disney. Oh my God, I was actually quoting that today. How crazy is that, right? That's uh -huh. amazing. I find the synchronicities. <laughs> that's okay, nobody else has to. No, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> She'll laugh. She'll just always do it. it. It's <laughs> um, we are all good. Should I read our Yes, okay. read away. Read okay. away. We are all good at something. We all have been born with our own special set of gifts. While some of us have a gift for the written word, others have a gift of speech. While some have the gift of discovery, others apply what is discovered. While some have a gift of, organiza of organization, others lead and inspire. The bottom line is that each one of us contributes to the beautiful fabric of this world. No one person can do it all. Ah, like I really didn't plan that. <laughs> <laughs> we need one another to make this life experience all that it can be. So if we all bring our best to the table, we will inspire others to follow our example. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that we are good at, we must do it well. So if you're here to sweep floors because you enjoy cleanliness, do it well. If you are here to heal the sick, be present and compassionate in the whole process. Mm -hmm. If you are here to fight for justice, do not forget to be just. Whatever you choose, do that. Whatever you choose to do that brings you happiness and joy, do it with pride. For when you do, you bring your own magic and miracles, and we can all take pride in having experienced the kind of enthusiasm that is contagious. Take pride in what you do and do it well. There you go. So, so yes, Michelle, that is exactly what you picked for today's intention, which makes total sense. Um, I have to tell you, you know, one of the greatest things in life is if you're exposed, and I mean really this, and if you start the conversations with people 
who do something well in an area that you're not so good in because then you definitely have an opportunity to start the conversation which I think is so important especially now during these times that we live right now is that instead of holding your tongue don't be afraid of engaging and having the conversations that will significantly make a difference in that world because first of all like Michelle said one of the, do, one of the things I do love is to listen but you're gonna be heard and then when you're heard then my god who knows what is who is gonna hear you what kind of open uh, conversation you can start and what kind of book you know you can write together so um, I want to say Michelle has definitely been that for me as well as many of you Brandon as well one of my one of my faves out there Susanna and Linda and Jessica all of you thank you so much tonight for joining us um, I will definitely keep you all up to date as to the accomplishments of this incredibly tremendous you know a champion of the environment and so much more I think that you have to have a true love passion desire passion pleasure and purpose in everything that you do um, to the extent that you can not too exhausted but you know the whole idea is that we all can be the spark for each other to do and make a difference so you know if you want to continue to manifest your dreams you know that you can live your path live your passion and purpose in many different ways you can certainly contact me um, and or get your book the magical guide to bliss today which I'm coming out soon with the beautiful butterfly which is my second book and also sparkling I'm super excited about both of those Beautiful butterfly is the journey that I took inspired by the magical guide to bliss I can't wait to share that with everybody um, and once again thank you to Michelle I like to give my guests the final word before we sign off and it goes to you um, you know, uh, no one should have to do everything, but everyone should do something. So if you feel that this is important, doing a little something will actually have a multiplier effect in ways that you can't really appreciate in the moment, but, um, join us. Join us. And you know what? It's not time now to sit on the sidelines. You need to come in and be involved figure out something if you you know pick it up and just go and we're all going to take care and help each other and and by doing that we go so far like Michelle said what was the quote again um no I mean, one should have to do everything but everyone should do something and if we go alone oh if yeah. you, if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together there you go so let's do this together people it's really gonna make a difference remember you are the deliberate creators of your life let your soul be guided by your dreams and let's all go together to raise the positive vibrations on this planet so we can all live our bliss and you know enjoy the magic and miracles in your life and shine on your beautiful light and until the next time in July thank you all for joining in and have a really wonderfully magical rest of June. Take care. Oh, tune in for Poppy Palooza. We're leaving tomorrow and it's gonna be Broadway all day, every day for the next five days. So we welcome you to come apart and join us on that fun, fun journey of creative imagination and excitement. All right. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.